Good evening, everyone. I'm Shadi Abdul, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Irving Toro Itich and Zubeda Jibrili. Fortunately, our colleague, Juliet Saki Ansa, is unable to join us this evening due to unexpected circumstances, but she sends her apologies. Black in Architecture was founded by Juliet on the 17th of June, 2020, in the wake of Black Lives Matter in the UK and protests around the world following the killing of George Floyd. Reflecting on her experiences in the architecture education and practice, Julia felt compelled to respond. Inspired by the hashtag Black in the Ivory on Twitter, she created the hashtag Black in Architecture, which aims to share and amplify the voices and experiences of Black professionals in the UK architecture. The research project Black in Architecture, which Zubeda, Irving, Juliet and myself are current, current team members of, started on the 1st of July 2020 and has been collecting lived experiences with the aim of analysing these alongside existing data in order to propose a charter that will state a set of actions for change in the architectural profession. I'll be moderating the discussion during this event will present our collection of lived experiences of black students in education and black professionals in practice. These will be read out by Zubeda and Irving. We've categorized the lived experiences into two groups. After each category, we'll have a short discussion as a wider group of participants here this evening. As this is a participatory event, we want to hear your thoughts, questions and responses. So please use the chat box at any time during our presentation. The purpose of this evening is to get your ideas and recommendations that the Black in Architecture team can put together in the form of a charter for the profession. Some housekeeping rules before we get started. Please mute your mic when you're not speaking. When I call out your name, please address the group with your comments and please use the raised hand button if you wish to respond to a question or comment that another participant has raised. Next slide, please. Architecture is systemically racist. So what is the profession going to do about it? This was the headline to an article in the AJ published on the 23rd of July, 2020. A comment below the line caught our attention, which I will now read. Next slide, please. As the principle of an AJ practice, AJ 100 practice, I'm somewhat shocked and hurt by your headline. I can categorically confirm that in terms of recruitment and promotion and everything else to do with our team, we're completely fair in our criteria. And indeed, I have categorically never met anyone in any leadership position in architecture with a different perspective which is people on their talent and ability only, regardless of ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, or anything else. As an absolute fact, it is not morally, ethically, or even legally possible for us to favor one ethnicity over another. The real issue is the comparatively low number of BAME candidates entering the profession. To address this, we need to look at schooling, social aspiration, and maybe parental motivation. I would be astonished if universities are deliberate, deliberately filtering out Bain students, as seems to be implied. Let's resolve this under representation through considered action, not hyperbole. We will now present the lived experiences of black students and professionals in architecture in the UK. I will hand over to Zubeda and Irving. Hi, yes, um, I'm Irvin, and I will read to you um, this, the lived experiences that we've been getting, and it's categorized, as Shadi said, between students and uh, professional experience, and I will be reading, me and um, Zubeda will be reading the student experiences. And let me just get the first one up. Um, so we'll be alternating, I'll read the first one, Zubeda will read the, the second one, and so, so on, so forth. The first one. One of my tutors who taught me in my master's field, in my master's year that, that I just completed really encouraged me and, and to be bold 
and courageous to explore the racial injustices of black communities in my project. He recognized and reminded me of the importance and relevance of this topic, and he could see that, there's something, that that's something I wanted to do. Initially, I tiptoed around my subject for around my subject for my project, not trying to cause any other students or tutors to feel uncomfortable. But thankfully, with the encouragement of my, of my other tutor, I did not have to. He gave me so many black oriented references and introduced me to other black people who also who, who have also explored similar themes. He was, he was Lebanese, but also grew up in Nigeria. So he was one of the tutors who could somewhat understand my project without having to over explain it because he was familiar. This relationship alone changed my whole final experience. And I'm sure having more diverse and black tutors at university level would help push an alternative curriculum, which we black students can relate to more. The line isn't very close. Sorry, I think it's a storm. Uh huh. Um, um, it's Okay. Um, it's not very. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, okay. Yeah. I stopped. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. So I'll start again. Sorry about that. Thank you. I was in a group of five. I was in a group of about five during a breakout session in a Reba Part Three seminar at London-based School of Architecture. When the lecturer, who was a white male, made a bold announcement that he wanted the person who presents a summary from each group discussion to be someone who spoke English as his or her native or first language. With everyone assuming that the lecturer meant someone with a white middle-class English accent, we nominated the person who sounded most like that. This person happened to be a London-born British Asian. Everyone else, including myself, who would have said English was their first language, had an accent that I believe this lecturer wanted to avoid hearing. The white students were Europeans who spoke English as their second language. This school is well known for its international activities and for attracting a good number of international students. It came as a surprise to me to hear this request. I wonder if his approach and lack of tolerance was endorsed by the school. Ah, uh, this is a third response. Some students struggled to have a suitable technical setup to produce work during the COVID-19 lockdown, or at least at the start of the lockdown. A senior, member at the as at a senior member of staff with a good level of influence expressed to myself and a colleague that she couldn't understand or believe how anybody would wish to pursue an architecture degree without a high-spec computer or any computer at all. I wanted to tell her that I would and I was, I was once one of those students. Architecture shouldn't be left for the privileged few. It, would, it, would also make, it also made me think, how can a system be fair when those in such positions continue to hold this attitude towards young aspiring professionals? Sorry. Who 
for my recently completed master's degree, my tutor introduced me to people who were very supportive for my thesis on, rep on representation and identity. This experience, however, isn't the same for other BAME students who ended up in architecture schools with inflexible philosophies. The lack of diversity in studio philosophy often pushes us, pushes all the students to produce similar work outputs. It can make students feel less than average about their performance. As an international student, I noticed the lack of BAME mentors on the REBA mentorship program, as well as on the government tier two sponsorship list. I feel like many BAME students drop out of university or feel less motivated because there are a limited number of practices with people who look like us and who could therefore act as our mentor. 2020 brought to so many issues in the industry, but it also revealed to me that there are a few more BAME leaders in industry than I had previously thought. On beginning my architecture studies at the University of Edinburgh in 2016, I found architectural history to be one of the more, most interesting and more enjoyable courses. However, I was surprised that the course intended to provide an in-depth history of world architecture had such, a, had such a limited range of African architecture history beyond ancient Egyptians. This was extremely disappointing for several reasons. Firstly, having felt underrepresented, unrepresented in my history, history studies in every syllabus throughout my primary and secondary education, I was optimistic that, that university academia would provide a more unbiased and balanced view of history. Furthermore, this blatant omission reinforced antiquated, antiquated ideas of, about African architecture and the continent in general. Not only, for, not only to a new crop of architecture students, but a cohort of arts and history students also. Lastly, exploring books such as Manuel Herr's uh, African Modernism and similar literature, it became evident that the continent has more than sufficient works of architectural and engineering significance to be relevant and included in our learning. As the history we learn largely determines the precedents we use in our design. It is easy to see, then understand the subsequent omission of black architects in our design courses, discourses. This is something that desperately needs to change. The racism experience in the British architectural experience is very subtle and quiet, yet it's still very real. You constantly feel like you have to inconvenience yourself to suit the general community. The most obvious and clear experience I had was on, was, was on my job experience during my third year, a semester out of practice. Before the day I was meant to start working, I met with someone from the company to discuss my plan of work. After discussing the business related side, he started hinting at the look of my hair and advised me to cut it or make it look neater in order to have a more accessible work look. This is wild to me because that was just how African natural hair grew. Nonetheless, I inconvenienced myself and conformed. On getting to the job the next day, I actually saw a white man with hair to the length of the back unpacked a loose let fly, and that really got me shook and kind of annoyed because the only difference between him and me and him, I guess, was just the color of the skin. I never really brought it up, I just got swept under the rug like just every other form of racism experience on by numerous of color. My experiences within university have, been, have seen me be profiled and mistaken for other students simply because I wear a hijab, ignoring the fact that other students, wear, that other students wearing hijabs within my course were Asian, whilst a mixed race black. In other instances, I have had lectures make remarks about racism, saying it's all over now. We've apologized for this, showing us images of human zoos with black people in cages whilst maintaining direct eye contact with me. When applying for jobs, I have always made it a priority to look at whether officers employ black or any other POC, people of color for that matter. I don't want to be in the position where I am alienated and dismissed for being the only other person in a room. In previous situations where I have tried to address issues I or other people of color face, my concerns were dismissed. 
and it destroyed my confidence. It took me a while to build it up and it's not coming back. Being a black student in architecture is having to write essays in colonial urbanism. It's constantly having, it's having to constantly explain your existence. It's not seeing a, a single black tutor at university because after all, we are minorities. It's tough being the only black African student in a classroom. It's even harder being the only black Muslim student in the classroom. Nevertheless, I will not exchange my energy for anything. For every single facet of me has shaped the way I see the world. Every single negative experience has taught me resilience, courage, and determination. When I was architect, it was not really the best for you to study. I was bent on proving them wrong. When I, looked, when I was looked down upon by my peers, I felt because clearly they didn't understand where I'm coming from, and most importantly, where I wish to be. My experience in architectural education has been an overwhelmingly white one. For the architects we study, from the architects we study to the lecturers themselves, I found it increasingly difficult to picture myself, a mixed race female, in the professional world. Throughout my time at university, I've written essays reflecting on the homogeneity and inaccessibility of the architecture profession to minority races. It made me consider how the architectural profession favors those with plentiful time for education and abundant money. Which is, re which is resulting in architecture design primarily, primarily by and for white people. A change in this homogeneous field will allow people of color to feel represented and catered to in the architecture surrounding us. I'm sorry, diminishes the plight of those that experience it. However, I have certainly experienced some unfairness during the course of my architectural education. During my studies in university, I remember one instance during a design presentation with my group. This particular tutor would only listen to the white members in the group. It was alarming at first when I realized that whenever I or other non-white members of the group said something, they would, be, they would be ignored. This experience became very obvious because when the uh, one, because when the one person said something to the non-white members, the responses would be different. It was clear to me that there, were, there was racial bias in place, which made me feel like my opinions or input didn't matter. A silver lining, I left this group for a different one, achieved the highest grade there. That is the end of the first section of experiences and then open it to discussion and give it back to Shadi to facilitate this. Thank you, Zubeda and Irving. Now we want to hear from you all. Let us know what you think about what you've just heard. What re recommendations would you put forward to address some of the issues raised in those lived experiences? Um, please use the chat box and um, so we can call out your name and you can address the wider group of participants here this evening. <laughs> we do want some participation. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> okay. So I will kick off. I would say some of the um, students' experiences refer to um, the type of architecture that is taught in schools. It's not very inclusive of diverse, um, it's not very inclusive of other cultures. Um, one student mentioned that um, African architecture is um, extensive enough that we could be taught that in architecture education and for whatever reason we have a very Eurocentric, not for whatever reason I, I know why, but we have a very Eurocentric um, education that, is, that doesn't open the perspective up for um, inclusion of architecture from other cultures. Does anyone have anything else to contribute to continue this discussion? What do you think about that, Irving, coming from Kenya? Uh, coming from Kenya, um, I, was, I was also kind of quite shocked that the, the 
types of um, material we have in university does not include, barely includes anything to do with African architecture. In fact, I, I did want to do um, a, an essay once on, on, on Ghana, but having discussed this with my tutor, uh, she told me that if you can get anything on it, I'll be, I'll be supportive, but I do know it's very difficult to get onto that, to get any material to this, to have a whole thesis on it. So I ended up not being able to do a thesis on what I wanted to do just because I did not have the material to do that. Okay, I will ask Rene Toby to share his thoughts about what he's just heard. Rene? So I didn't exactly hear what he said because the audio wasn't working that well. Um, we, um, you're, you made a comment that we wanted to know if you could please share with the wider participants. Um, you mentioned that you were shocked by the statements that you heard from the students. Oh, what shocked me? Oh, um, yes. oh sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, I was making a comment and I was really not being specific. Um, that anyone would say, to, sorry, this makes me emotional, that anyone would say to anyone, could one person from a group speak who has English as their first language? I am offended that anyone would make a statement like that. Yeah. Uh, also that uh, a Russell Group University uh, teaches a history of global architecture and uh, leaves out the global south, or you know, the one about the history of Western architecture. I thought that we had thrown away a history of Western architecture that started at Mesopotamia, went to Egypt. I thought we tossed that out the window 20 or 30 years ago. So I find that also um, a bit shocking, unless it's contextualized as a, as a particular narrative. Could I, ask, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could I ask if you're a tutor and- Yes, I'm a lecturer, yes. Okay, a lecturer, that's great. Um, in the UK or yes. outside the UK? And in terms of um, the, the course and architecture history, is it very diverse in terms of what the content that's covered? I'm the, I teach at the University of East London and I've been coordinating history and theory teaching there uh, for a few years. And I've also taught history and theory elsewhere. And I always ensure that architecture is inclusive in terms of presenting architecture. For those who are familiar with it, I often start with Bannister Fletcher's tree of architecture that has this sort of Western tree and everything else is a sort of strange branch. And I chop it down. And I do that first lecture in, in first year. And as students progress through the years to different levels, if they're interested, all students are invited or, uh, or in, sort of inspired to speak about things that interest them, whether it's uh, a background that goes back many generations, a particular part of London, like, you know, a particular, their manner in London, because we get a lot of local students, uh, or any other aspect that they feel that they would like to explore more. And uh, we get some really fantastic uh, essays from the students. And I, when I said I was encouraged, uh, it's nice to read that there are lecturers who do that and that actually that the students enjoy it. I can only tell you the students do well, they seem to enjoy it. For me, it's really encouraging to hear from the students' point of view that, that they do enjoy it and, and gain something from that. That's great. Thank you very much for contributing. Um, I will go next to Nana, who has a question. Nana, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for that. Um, while uh, definitely quite harrowing and bringing up personal experiences. It's great to have a forum to, to have these conversations and reflections openly. Um, at the very start of the kind of recent um, Black Lives Matter movement, I, I was quite struck about the idea that are white people having conversations about race in the same way that black people are or POCs are? And I think in light of the um, things that you just talked about, I wonder 
um, and maybe it's a question to the floor actually, um, if the same can, we can think about it in the same way, are white students feeling impacted by the narrow scope of the, of the architectural education they receive in schools? Um, it strikes me as that the conversation about race has to include white people. Um, and that's not um, a task for us. I think it's a task for uh, white people to critique and look at. Um, and I just wonder actually that this lack of representation and discourse of architecture, I wonder if they also feel themselves impacted by it um, in any way. So that's my question slash observation, I guess. Yes. Um, do we have anyone who would like to respond to Nana's question? Any participants that would like to respond? Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, great. fantastic. So yeah, I would like to respond. I think, I think one of the biggest issues, and I think that is actually where the matter of the problem is, and Nana and I work together, by the way, so we're on the same page here. <laughs> I'm, I'm head of architecture and landscape at Kingston University, and we, we worked on a project uh, in Ghana together this year. And, and part of the critique, the main critique of, of the studio was this Eurocentric education of architecture. And so shifting the lens to look at architecture from the global south towards, not as a counter, not as in opposition, but just to give a different perspective, to give another lens, another perspective. And I think, I think that's something that's, that's essential because what I have found in, in, in our sort of reflection, I've been reading a lot of bell hooks. And what's really interesting when she talks about transgression in the classroom and, and giving voice to the non-traditional student, you know, it, she's describing a classroom setting in the early 90s that is still the same today. And it's not the non-white students issue. And I think this is something we have got to face, that the problem is the problem, it's a systemic racism, there's no doubt there. Otherwise, BAME, the whole BAME acronym would not exist if it wasn't systemized or systemic. But I think we have to, as people white as myself with privilege, need to reflect on ourselves and our role in, in this situation. And it is up to us to make that difference. And I am completely on board. I'm very, and Nana knows this, I'm, I'm proactive and I'm doing everything that I can, but I can't do it alone. It has to be collaborative and it has to be at a higher level as well. So, but I do believe, by the way, that it begins on the ground. I'm very much about ground operation because I think this is where the real thing happens. You know, if eventually, hopefully at the top, we can start to change things, but I think it's got to start at the, in the classroom with the right conversations. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, and just before we move to the next part, I'm just going to let Sarah come in. She's got a very good question in terms of grassroots and um, the moment, that, the movement that started. Sarah, could you please ask your question? Sarah, are you there? Sarah? Okay. Um, we'll have to move to the next section of our presentation. Oh, Sarah's there. She's there. Oh, perfect. sorry. Apologies. Sarah? Oh, I think her audio isn't working. Okay. I can ask her a question, actually. She asked, um, do you think the momentum is dying down now for Black Lives Matter, especially in the architecture world? Does anyone, would anyone like to respond to that? Not if I have anything to do with it. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's only just started. Go, go Mary Johnson. <laughs> well, like you say, we can only do so much. And yeah. every, every person doing a bit makes an effort. And yeah. I don't think that you're, the, the voices may have died down. It's up to you to keep them going. But some of them have been heard. And because they've been heard, they've had to be uh, started to be written into policy. 
Writing it into policy is one thing, and we need to make sure it's not a box ticking exercise, and that's where everyone has to take part. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, Sarah, we couldn't quite hear you there, but I hope we've answered your question. So we're moving on to the next section of our presentation. Irving, I'll hand over to you now. Hi, yes. Uh, so we're moving on to the next section, which is still lived experiences, but in the professional world. So we just saw the education and the education experiences, and now we go to professional experiences. As a black female architect running a micro practice, the question of whether I am commissioned on a project tends to be a delicate balance act between the prospector's presumption that I will more than likely not be competent not be incompetent at how low can my fees go to tempt taking the risk. I often get the feedback, your fee proposal is way too high. I had long, accept, I had long accepted this as a fair enough response in, response in the marketplace and depending on my client's budget. But in the last year, I would intentionally propose a very, very low fee to bid for a prospectus, for a prospect that I thought would be a good source of additional streams of work, so long as I could dispel this doubt of my competence. Even at this ridiculously low fee level, he thought that my fee proposal was too high. In that moment, it became clear to me that my race and my gender is very much linked to how, how much I can demand in the marketplace from specific sections, from specific sections of our society. My most successful projects have been those where the fees were both fair, were fair for both parties, the client and myself. And interestingly enough, the clients have always been people originally from other places. Perhaps this connection that we perhaps this connection that we share allows us to trust that my portfolio experience and references are sufficient for, for them to take a chance on my competency. I think um, Sibeda, I might read this one just because the sound quality isn't so good. I think I might read this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Equality is a major issue in the world. I'm constantly pushing for equality and it doesn't really matter how hard I work or how good my work is. I constantly have to prove myself. The partners or directors in the practice already have a set image of the practice they want to project to clients and the general public. And most times a black person does not fit that image. A partner once said to me, you're very lucky that the clients are happy you're managing this project. They're very nice. It felt like I was being given an opportunity, or I am a charity case, when I worked so hard to get to where I am. There's a massive bias and equality issue today, and we need a genuine, authentic conversation to move forward. After working for a practice for six years and leading, and leading on the delivery of a number of projects, including three that were, that were, that were award-winning, a white architect that had recently joined the practice was offered a promotion to associate level, despite my demonstrate, demonstrable credentials for the, whole, for the role. What if, what if you didn't know my name? What if you didn't see my color? What if you could only see my intellect? What if we were wearing the same clothes? What if he understood my feelings? What if freedom of speech was not so free? What if we were to speak with our native languages? What if I brought my cuisine? What if I spoke about my household? What if we didn't think alike? What if we shared the same blood? What if we spoke about our history? What if we spoke about our privilege? 
What if we really worked as sibling? Yes, as brothers and sisters. What if inequality was real? The most racial injustice I've experienced to date are from women within the industry. So when we talk about equality for women in construction, we need to be very careful and talk about injustice within that group, i.e. women in construction. I had to pull out of my office mentoring scheme when I found out that, that the white female director who mentored me shared what I told her in confidence with random people in the practice. I think it is very important for black architects for black architects to be in director slash partner positions within the practice. It is not enough that it is not enough that they are women. There needs to be people of color, male and female, in leadership positions. It is a white male dominated industry and you'll find that many white architects in the industry have never worked with black architects. You find that in the office. There's strange comments and conversations within the practice about race. Most times I say to myself it's due to ignorance and when I do contribute to such conversations or try to educate people I'm told I'm overly sensitive or taking it personally. Most times, a black person challenging such issues is not well received, as you're perceived as making people in the practice uncomfortable. I would prefer to be mentored by someone who understands my experiences and is able to provide constructive advice instead of dismissing them as nothing. It can be very frustrating to try to please people that are that to try to please people to be to be accepted as equal. I find that most times I am not myself and I'm constantly trying to live up to people's expectations within the practice, not in terms of work, but more to do with relationships with colleagues. And sometimes this does not even help, this does not even help because the practice already has a set image they are trying to project. So for, for example, they may choose to promote someone who makes them look good and fits the image if, it's, if it is the same, per, if the same person is not as good when it comes to the actual work. I was called slow, accused of smoking cannabis and felt very outside for a very long time in my, in my practice, in my first practice. As a black project architect, you could be leading a team of young white architectural assistants. I find that some assistants find it difficult taking instructions from a black project manager. I feel my entire career as an architect has been about pushing against these issues and advocating for equality. It may be that the way forward is to start my own practice and be more vocal about equality issues in the industry. I can't even be vocal where I currently work as I will risk losing my job. Unless I am perfect and confident, Every time I step through their door, I am the subordinate CAD jockey, stuck doing the work nobody wants to do twice as good to get equal. I find that some people within the practice do not want, do not want you to design or would rather do markups for you to draw despite your experience. I always push back against this. There are others who would prefer you do not speak at a client meeting, at a client's meeting, despite doing most of the work and drawing. Overhearing conversations from one white man saying he doesn't like girls with frizzy hair. His voice is confident and loud and projected microaggressions. If you are very good at your work, you are considered a threat. If you are not, if you are just good, you are told you're not working hard enough. Worked in a small team where one director never acknowledged me, even mm -hmm. if we were the only people in the office on busy days. Not a word until a new woman came, white, and he was very chatty, but still remained very hostile towards me. So, 
those are the end of experiences, lived experiences in practice. Um, it will be good to hear from you all about what you made of that and what recommendations you would suggest for how we may, how the practice may, uh, the profession might address some of these issues. Um, I'm going to start with, bear with me a second, with um, Zechariah, who's got a question he would like to put to the wider group. Sorry, I've just made him a co-host now. If you wanted to ask, Sekara. Shall I start? Maybe he'll jump in. Um, he says he's never had an issue with tutors who are white. When I was a student at some architecture schools, I felt it's down to demonstrating talent and desire to become an architect. When I did with tutors, it uh, is that I get them to know myself and share my culture background as a black student. And that really engages them to help myself achieve my expectations. My white tutor, tutors were empathetic and supportive due to my creative talent and skills in architecture. Um, I believe you also had a question in regards to practice. Are you still there, Zechariah? Would anyone else like to jump in in regards to experiences in practice? Yeah. Um, it's interesting, I will sort of pick up on microaggressions and um, because it's sort of, it's very subtle, um, the, the experiences, um, the people, the daily lived experiences in practice. Um, it's very subtle, very um, covert, and sometimes it's hard to pinpoint um, whether what you're, experience, what you're experiencing is a racist, um, a racist experience or discriminatory experience. It's very covert. So I would say it's interesting, um, some of the comments that have been mentioned in regards to not being included in meetings or not being actually even included in conversations, not being interacted with like others in practice. I think um, that is, I would say, yeah, that tends to be a common experience that I've come across with other black architects in practice. Do we have any further questions? Oh, Nana says she had a question. I'm not really sure it's a question, more of an observation. I think a lot of these things, um, uh, there is a kind of culture in architecture which is very kind of um, based on who you know and um, sort of navigating through that um, process to get, to get a job or, you know, employment. And I've often found that some of the most troubling instances of um, uh, racial abuse and inappropriate comments happen in small practice where there is no um, separation between your boss and who runs the practice or the practice director and um, or HR. So who do you complain to when an incident happens? Whereas in slightly larger practices, there are more formal processes. And given that um, a large amount of um, architectural practices are small businesses. Um, how do you tackle that? How do you create a culture of accountability when the person who you would seek accountability from is the person perhaps also um, maybe not managing the, the situation properly? And I think that in, in architecture, we've seen a lot of talks over the last few months with engaged larger practices who perhaps have better systems and that actually in small practice, that question needs to be asked as well. 
I'll just jump in there, Nana. It's interesting that you say that it's the smaller practices that perhaps don't have the systems in place, the HR systems in place to deal with any complaints. Um, in my experience, it's, it's actually, yeah, my um, more, more extreme experience has been in larger practices. Yeah, so um, I find that um, it's, there's, a, there's a willingness to be, to, inc to, to employ, um, uh, I say willingness, there's a sort of a tick box exercise to employ people from diverse backgrounds, from ethnic, uh, ethnic BAME backgrounds, but once they are in practice, there's still the culture within the practice that's yet to be addressed. So it's, not a, it's often not a culture that's inclusive. So being students and um, architects are often trying to go through a fitting process. And that fitting in means a certain sort of loss of character or identity or whatever. It's like we are having to adapt to fit into the culture of the workplace. Whereas actually it needs to be the other, the other way around. The workplace needs to be more inclusive more accepting of other cultures, more open, so we can all be our true self and, and celebrate diversity that our culture has. Yeah. I, I would, can I jump in? Yes, please. I would suggest, I, I would agree with you, actually, I think the larger the institution, the more systemized it becomes, in a way. So the ticking box exercise becomes almost justifiable when it's a larger institution. And I think we definitely experienced this in higher education. Uh, we, we had, you know, I've had uh, a, a situation where, and I think it goes back to your comment about microaggression. I think this is something that's not um, completely understood on, on the white side, I should say. And, and I've experienced this and I've seen it where the response to that is, I didn't realize that I had actually perform microaggression, right? And, and I think it's, and, and this is my response to that, is that's, that is the problem. The problem that you are not conscious of it. You're actually not aware of it. And, and my, my youngest said to me that for those who don't understand microaggression, it's a racialization of passive aggressiveness. And I think it was such a perfect way of putting it because everybody understands passive aggressive. Microaggression is exactly the same thing, but racially biased. And I think once we begin to learn what that means and become more conscious of that, we can begin to change things. But I think that's really where the problem is. There's such an unconsciousness of that, an unawareness of the impact that these microaggressions are having on a daily, and I think this is the other thing, is that it's, it's not understood on the white side that this is a daily experience, that there's a constant almost watching your back, you know, having to constantly be alert to saying the wrong thing and being misunderstood. And it's daily. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that we have to start understanding as white people who are not experiencing that on a daily basis to begin to be more empathetic and more conscious and aware of the impact that we, we do unconsciously. We say, I, I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. And, and it's, it's, I think, you know, it's something that the system or the conditions have created to a point we're not conscious as white people in a privileged position. And I think it's something we have to really work hard at. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take work and effort but I think it's necessary. Yeah. So can I, I, can I quickly come back to you on that? Um, when you say it's going to take work and it's necessary, a lot has been said about unconscious bias training. Um, yeah, I'm... But, but it's not with making any effort. It's basically listening and oftentimes it's, a, it's something online, right? So I listen, I watch it, I understand it. Logically, it makes sense. But then I go back to my comfort zone, to my everyday life, which is comfortable. So what I'm saying and suggesting that we have to become more uncomfortable in order, if we want to make a difference, if we want to truly be proactive, 
and we want to change this situation, it's going to be up to the white community to be comfortable with the uncomfortable, to, to be in an uncomfortable position where we will make mistakes and we will say the wrong thing, but we're willing to be accountable for it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm going to try Sarah again. I think she'd like to address the wider group. Sarah, are you there? I think Renee had raised her hand too. <laughs> okay. Sarah, are you there? I'm going to give you a second and then I've got to move on. Sarah. Okay, I'm going to move to Renee. Renee, are you there, please? Yes, as another uh, looking white Tutored in architecture school in the UK, I completely agree uh, with everything uh, that Mary Johnson said. And I can only reiterate uh, the difficulty that we all have to face, white people have to face up to being wrong, to saying the wrong thing. You're not going to get it right the first time. Um, and, it, and the microaggressions are not understood, I think, by white people. And it's very difficult to feel it. And I've often had to deal with conflict between students where a black student from Lewisham accused a white German tutor of racism because of what she'd said. Uh, and she felt that because she wasn't racist, that what she'd said wasn't racist. But I had to explain to her that actually, whatever her intentions were, they were heard in a particular way by a particular person. And that she had to be aware that communication works both ways. And what we say isn't always the way that it's perceived. Yeah. And we don't always get it right. And uh, I also wanted to bring up a point about the, the stories from people in, in practice, which is that who would approach their boss and say you're a racist? Like many of you would, and I would commend you for that, but most junior architects, whatever their color or background, whatever racist, sexist, anything is comments that are made when I was in practice, I would never have said anything to my boss, ever. And no one would, or about anything. We didn't talk to our bosses like that. And at one point when I was a junior architect, uh, not the boss, but someone else, did make a very overt racist comment uh, about another race. And uh, I called her on it. And uh, she looked at me, and like, like eyes like this. Uh, and I didn't say you're racist. I just said, oh, can you please explain that, please? Or how does that work? Uh, and she just stared at me. And I have to be honest, this was a mixed race office with people from every part of the world and looking all completely different. Not one person spoke to me for the next week. Not one. No one ever made a comment about what I'd said and no one spoke to me. And then sl slowly things sort of got back to normal because I had said something that nobody wanted to think about. And I don't know how young people in a big practice today with uh, all the difficulty of finding work and keeping a job would be brave enough to say those things, uh, except that you are, and I commend you for it, and keep saying them. Uh, that's all I can say, really. Uh, I think, um, great, yeah. thank you. To follow up on Renee's point, that was, I uh, perhaps made it badly, but that was the point I was trying to make about the small practice mm -hmm. um, scenarios, that in a big practice, at least, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not advocating that there is no uh, racial uh, abuse in large practices, there are. Um, but I think in a larger practice, at least, there is somebody that you can complain to, uh, or a formalized process of complaint. Whereas in a small practice, I can imagine, like the story that Renee's just told, where do you go? Who do you say anything to if, if that happens? And I think that, um, especially in architecture where a lot of um, companies are small practices, we have to have these conversations in, in, with, with that in mind that um, by not addressing those things, we are actually uh, kind of skirting around it a, a little. And I think, um, I, I, I listen to Renee say that it's, it's hideous, absolutely hideous. But I also think, imagine if you're black <laughs> on top of yeah. that, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. This is it. Yeah. yeah. This is it. So thank you. <laughs> but I think I think I'd like to take this moment to thank Architecture Foundation because it has allowed us to have a platform 
that I think is been pretty incredible. Um, and we've had several conversations now about this on this platform. And I just really want to give thanks to that because I think it has to be collective and it has to be conversations that continue. This is not something that's going to be solved overnight. This is something that's going to, you know, and maybe we never solve it, but we have to keep working at it. And it's going to be an ongoing working at it. And I think having this platform is pretty amazing to have to be in a collective environment where we can have these conversations publicly. I think it's great. I just wanted to just jump in and say, um, yeah, not at all. Like, please don't yeah, thank us at all because all of these proposals have come from all of you, everyone else. Like, we're just here in the background and um, this is not the end of these conversations. Mm -hmm. Like, these are, I hope that they continue um, and we, have, we are be able to provide the space for that again. So I'm going to try Sarah, <laughs> keep going back to Sarah. I don't know if she's there and if she's ready to ask her question. Is she there? She's now a co-host again. She just, she had to rejoin the chat. Yeah. Hoping it works now. She's asked to be unmuted. Hello? Yeah, great. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, apologies to everybody. Um, I just wanted to um, make the point, I totally agree what um, Mary said, what you've said, Shay, and I think that that's what my general feeling is, is that for too long, especially the comment made about integration, I think that integration has been left at the door of people of colour for too long. It's really hard to integrate into a system that doesn't actually allow you to integrate into it, if that makes sense. You can't how, how are you supposed to do there needs to be a willingness from both sides mm. you can't just integrate on your own and um, I think the problem lies with practices big or small it's it's a systemic thing and it's really hard to pinpoint and if if you haven't experienced racism and you are a person of color I think you're extremely lucky and extremely rare because the microaggressions are constant and it's something you have to learn to deal with I mean I studied architecture I did a part one and I did a part two I'm not going to mention universities because I don't know what we're allowed to say but I, I, I struggled and it was mainly the microaggressions the hidden things I've had people said extremely racist things to me where as a joke and this came from tutors and it's also your ideas being put down your generally that that feeling of not being valued and then that other maddening feeling of whether you try to work out is this because of the color of your skin is it because you're not good enough and i had to when i left um architecture school and i finished my ma i had to set up my own practice because it was just extremely difficult to be hired by anyone i had to i had to just do my own thing in a way and, and find a way of making a living because i realized that being hired and being valued within a practice it's rare and and I had been hired in a practice and I did have a good experience but if they're not in a position to hire me again or they don't have the funds it means that I'm left at the mercy of everybody else so and and that's difficult why why should people have to start their own practices it is a good thing but it's not necessarily a great thing for everyone not everybody wants to start their own practice and they just want to be treated equally and generally I, I, I worry that this momentum with Black Lives Matter will die down and this this mm. now like thinking and it's being brought to people's attentions. People are shocked, especially white people. No, no person of color is shocked, but mm. everybody else is very, very shocked. Mostly white people are shocked about the racism, the level of racism in architecture, especially within with liberal people who voted Labour who are now being accused of racism. And it's true because it's it's something that we're aware of and I just worry and that's the question that I have is like how do we hold people accountable and how do we keep the momentum going because it's easy to say that it will keep going but I we know from history that these things repeat and we have ups and downs so how do we keep it going and see true change does anyone want to come on that Architecture Foundation has promised that we will have this platform as long as we want it, Sarah. So I think we should continue these kind of conversations publicly. 
And so I mean, I'd like to say I'm happy that the Architecture Foundation has decided to do that, but I think it's also a, a wider issue that it's Definitely. that in a way that's also not enough. Um, I'm just wondering how yeah. Like, for example, if we look at Rebo, if we look at the education, all of the MAs uh, the, and all of the undergraduates, and the, it, it needs to be more than that. And change for me can't come fast enough. Yeah. And in a way, I, 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 I no longer accept promises. I need to see actions. Agreed. Yeah, I agree. And I think actually in response to that, I'm disappointed that, which I guess is not surprising, but that as, as white people, we are underrepresented in this platform and I think it should be the other way around in some ways. We should be the ones having this conversation. And I think, Renee, you just sent a comment on training and more training, but does it make us see ourselves differently? And I think that's a really important point to make because it really is about looking at ourselves and it's really about being willing to, to do that in a critical way and being, being willing to be accountable for our part in this uh, as well. I agree with you, Sarah. It's, it's hard to see how this is going to continue, but I'm certainly going to do everything I can. I would just like to jump in on that. So I think it's also down to the lots of organizations in architecture that are um, bringing this to the fore. Um, so it's about us continuing the discussion, the debate, and um, making it not a, a fringe discussion, but a mainstream discussion, but we need to keep it going. And so if we want to see change, we, we need to do that. But we also need to, um, we need white counterparts to be part of that conversation Absolutely. and that debate. Absolutely. Yes, and I'm just thinking about um, different ways of uh, writing things into policy, but also implementing it into practice. Uh, one of the ways that I work is through education, uh, and I work with Charette, which is the Journal of Architectural Education. It'd be great to have a special edition just devoted to this particular subject. But I'm also thinking about the RIBA and the general attributes, and the ones that I work with for history and theory, they talk about teaching students about fine art and principal movements in you know, design and architecture, but they have a very Western slant, just the way that they're written. And it doesn't necessarily have to be specific, you know, talk about the global architecture, but just the language that's being used is very suggestive mm. of very old fashioned uh, art history type lessons. And I think that you, suggesting with, working with the RIBA and working with RIBA education to look at the language that we use, not necessarily put this down as something that needs to be taught, but just that the way that we're expressing ourselves and what we want to learn and what we think architecture is about is a debate that would be ongoing. And I think that the RIBA right now, for whatever reason, uh, would be open to that. And I know that there are, um, that the RIBA have the black females in architecture group and other groups I've been involved in. Uh, and I'm hoping that that has more of an involvement in the general attributes they have for architectural education rather than in just hosting events. I mean, I, 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 I agree. I think the curriculum needs to change, especially in, in terms of what's taught and what's valued. Because a lot of the times when I, I would go to history lectures in, in architecture, when Africa or the Middle East or any other country was spoken about, it was spoken about as something that is primitive. And as we know through history and through art education, that African art and African architecture is generally viewed and presented as primitive compared to its European counterparts. And I think that's also a shame and not true at the same time. It's something that when you're in the audience and you're a black student, especially if you're a black student from Africa, or from whichever country is being discussed, it's, it makes you feel othered, it makes you feel not valued, it makes you feel ashamed in some way, the way that you're hearing your culture and the continent that your ancestors or whatever are from, the way it's been spoken about. And I think it, it's just that lack of awareness and the lack of empathy and the lack of understanding and othering things, just because it's not from your culture, you think it's somehow less and that's like that, that comes under a wider umbrella. Right?
a lot, a lot of the times when you are you kind of think of biological racism, so when I say someone's racist, they think of Zubeda, I'm so sorry. The sound is not very right. Sorry, no worries. Are you able to use the chat box? Yeah. So sorry, the sound is so not clear. So sorry about that. Um, is does anyone else want to chip in? Okay, um, I've got um, no further questions. Um, Zubeda, did you want to ask a question? Sorry about the line, it's just so, um, so crackly. Technical issues. Um, hello, I've got a question. Can you hear Great. me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. it's Sakawaya. Um, my apologies for the sound I got issues with technology for the, some time. Um, just, um, just the response regarding um, the first um, discussion we had regarding student experience. What I tend to do is, um, with my cultural background, if I'm meeting someone who has no clue about my background whatsoever, I tend to have this um, dialogue with, with some white tutors. It'll be nice to get to know me, I'll get to know them. And then when you start to build that relationship, then um, it does build that um, harmony and this intimacy that would actually depend on them to help me to achieve my goals and expectation. And it really worked with the architecture schools I've attended um, beforehand. So it does, I think it's just presenting yourself at first hand. And I think it gives them, especially people who have no clue where you're from. And I think it does help them to give you that, um, you know, impression that, yeah, they really care about what I need to do to become an architect. Um, I did also as well send a uh, comment on uh, the second discussion regarding uh, student practice uh, practices. Um, I have, because um, I'm also self-employed, I have done some work for some clients who's worked in recruitment and they did say that one of the reasons why there's a low percentage of BME, um, you know, employers in big, big practices, if it's architecture, engineering or design or whatever, it tends to be a low percentage only because of the fact that um, some recruiters would look on their full like background. If it's a foreign name, they won't look on that. Or if it's someone who's got an English surname, like an English full name, sounds like they will get the job easily. And, I've, and he told me, because I was helping him design some kind of house for him in Liverpool, um, he told me that it's down to the fact that some companies have no time to get, get you know, that, um, engagement with people who are from, you know, from Africa or Asia or the Middle East or from, from those foreign countries. So I really felt like, I think, you know, especially in architecture practices, I really felt like they need some kind of, you know, you know, session, like a, you know, an introduction session with every person big, no matter if it's big or small practices. And I think that would actually engage people to understand where we're coming from, understand our, you know, our struggles and our way of living. Um, and I think that would actually give them some kind of, um, you know, opportunity just to cut down on ignorance and racism within these um, practices. So that's great recommendations that you put forward, Zechariah. Um, the point of this research is so that we can put a list of um, actions for changing the profession. So this is something we'll consider and we'll include and come back and present on um, in a second event that we've got arranged for the 26th of August. So I we have to conclude and draw to a close. Thank you everyone for participating in this event. It was most welcomed. And we hope you join us again for the second session, again, 26th of August, same time. And um, thank you all and have a good evening.